Okay, our next speaker is Ken Goldberg, who is an artist and professor at UC Berkeley. Ken is a pioneer in internet-based robotic telepresence and cloud-based robotics automation and has published over 200 peer-reviewed technical papers on algorithms for robotics, yeah, automation, job. and social information on. filtering. Uh, you, you, His you inventions try. have been awarded eight U.S. patents. Um, please welcome Ken Goldberg. Thank you. Thank you so much. I must say it's a very tough act to follow, Allison's uh, on the stage here, but I, I am such a, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to be here, and I, I think, um, I have to say, I've been admiring this lecture series and uh, what Piero has done over the last decade, and in particular, when he put something together like this event, I, I wasn't sure what to expect, but of course, I show up and there's a huge cacophony of activity going on and all these brilliant art exhibits and, and workshops and everything else, and then there's a full auditorium, and I just want to uh, salute you, Piero, for doing a fantastic job. Because it's really not easy and kind of a thankful ta thankless task to do these things. Um, so what I want to talk about in, in, this, in this period is about a concept of the uncanny. And um, let me first of all ask, how many of you uh, have heard of the uncanny valley before? Okay, good, a good number. And um, how many of you ha come, ha have a connection to Berkeley somewhere? Oh, good, not bad. Okay, go Bears. All right. So. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about uh, this, this idea, and uh, I might, let me put it in the context that I'm, I'm a roboticist, and I, I study robots. I really think about where they fit into the broader picture in terms of culture, and um, this is, I've been thinking about this particular phrase, that, that this is what I think is that, that all robots are mirrors in some sense. So just, just, just think about that for a bit as we talk, and then we'll come back to it at the end. I also want to, um, again, thank all the wonderful people I've had the chance to work with. All, everything I'm talking about today is a, is a collaboration with various students, artists, and writers. Um, so to, to, to step back for a second, some of my, a lot of my thinking is informed by the writings of Heidegger. And there is a particular essay called The Question Concerning Technology. And in this, this essay was written around 1954. He was looking about what, what is the, the question is, what is the essence of technology? What is technology? So it wasn't just all the machines and everything else, but he was actually asking something very, very profound, like what's at the core of all technologies? And the essay is short, and I recommend it, but to, to condense it for you, it's, uh, he comes to the idea that the essence is something um, uh, that he calls, he calls Gestell, which is the idea that we, that in, in, in technology, our, our, our goal, our technological mindset is to make nature available to us. But that's what it really is about, is availability of basically taking something as beautiful as this river and putting a dam on it so then it will be available to us for transformation into electricity and other things. And he talks about this. Uh, Gestell, by the way, is a German word. Um, and I'll use some German here, and I don't speak German, so uh, bear with me if I butcher the, uh, the, the, my pronunciation. But um, Gestell comes from a word uh, that's similar to uh, skeleton, and it's about framing. He calls it enframing, sometimes translated as enframing. It's about like putting things into boxes, like inventory. So the idea is put all of nature into these nice boxes, and then we can use it as we wish. Does that make sense? Like convenience and accessibility? That's a, that, he says this is the, the, the essence of technology. And in his essay, he says that the, um, this trend will continue, that we will actually we, we'll be more and more drawn to technologies that are universal, that, that expand our accessibility. And for example, things like plastics. So plastic is a technology, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a hyper-technology in a sense, because what you can do is you can make something available, you can form it into a, an object, and then you can melt it down and reform it into something else. So it's kind of a universal technology. And Heidegger talks about this, that this is actually the trend, that if you, technology as it evolves, it's going to become more and more like this, reusable, reconfigurable. And it applies to the technology that was very early stage when he wrote this essay, which was the, 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 the computer. And the computer is known as the uh, universal computing machine, right? It's a machine that doesn't just do one thing, but as we now know, does lots of different things. Because, because it could be reprogrammed. And that's the essential nature of a computer, is that it's a universal machine. 
The same is true, if you think about it, um, years later with the de development around the internet. The internet was to be not just one system of connections, but actually uh, 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 multiple connections, so that the, it could constantly be rerouted and reused, and the, and the, and the uh, protocols could be adapted to be available for all kinds of scenarios. In fact, the original motivation, as you may recall, was to make a, uh, a system that, was, that would be available even under the event of an atomic attack. So that even if you took out parts of the internet, other parts of it allow it to uh, continue to work. So this idea of availability, I think, is very profound and very important. Now, one thing Heidegger um, says at the, toward the end, it's kind of un, it's unclear when, you, when he's writing this. Well, he's, he's a little bit opaque, which, by the way, he's very opaque in many places. But one of them is, he says, well, the big danger about this is that we will turn this on ourselves. That we will take this, 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 this technological mindset and actually, it'll, it'll overcome, we'll, we'll start turning it on ourselves. And if you, I had to read this many times, and I had wonderful discussions with Hubert Dreyfus, who's a, um, a professor who just passed away at UC Berkeley. Uh, we taught a course on this, on this um, text, and we wrestled with this. Try to, what does this mean to turn this on ourselves? Is this, this is the great danger, Heidegger warns. And... Um, it's sort of like this. It's about that we will take technology so far that we will always make ourselves available. And I think this is very, was very prescient, right? Because that's really what we're doing today. Like, we're all hyper-available. We all have our phones on, probably right now. You're texting away. Um, we're connected. We're, we, we like to be available all the time. And he, this trend of availability is very, very powerful, it's irresistible to make ourselves increasingly available. So I, I, I like to, I think it's important, however, for us to push back, to resist this, this, ten this tendency. And by the way, another one is we talked about the, the computer, the internet, and another category is robots. Robots are also universal machines. They don't, there's a mechanism that doesn't just do one thing, but it can do lots of different jobs. Right? If it's just doing one thing, it's not really a robot. If it's, the idea of a robot is to be reprogrammable. All right, so now let's go back. The, the history of, of robots has, uh, is very rich and complex. And uh, we're celebrating today, the, um, or this semester, this year, the anniversary of, um, of, of, uh, uh, of, of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, as um, Allison just alluded. And uh, there's actually a very rich and beautiful history of, um, of, of, of mechanical machines that are human-like, automatons. And um, uh, one, of them I, one of my favorites is the Mechanical Turk. You may be familiar with this. How many are, have heard of it? It's a great story if you can look it up. But it was basically, actually, Allison referred to this uh, indirectly when she talked about Turkers. Um, but there, it's the idea that it was a famous um, robot that could play chess. Um, all the way back in the, um, in the 18th century, and it was actually very good at playing chess. It was so good that it would beat masters all over, and they took this around all over Europe and actually came to the U.S. as well, and it wasn't for many years until they figured out that actually there was a human inside hiding, a very small human. Um, actually, it was a couple different humans, but they all were expert chess players, and they were very, very, um, they didn't have uh, claustrophobia. They were very comfortable uh, sitting inside this little space. Now, um, a couple years after that, so the idea of automata was actually very much the rage around this time. It actually goes all the way back to Descartes wrote about automata. Um, but this, this essay, uh, this story comes out in 1816, and it's E.T.A. Hoffman, and it's called The Sandman. And um, you can look it up. It's, a, it's an interesting story about a, a robot, basically a, a creature that is very human-like. It's a, it's, a, it's a female, and um, a boy who falls in love with this robot. And there's a lot of nuances to it. It's a really a, kind of a horror story in a classical Gothic horror sense. And, but it has all this interesting in, nuances of, 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 of self-reference. And actually, it, uh, the boy is afraid that he's going to have his eyeballs stolen. Um, because the Sandman, the old origin, we talk about the Sandman and going to sleep. Apparently, in Germany, they, they used to sing this song about the Sandman. And if you don't go to sleep, he's going to throw sand in your eyes. In other words, you don't close your eyes tight. The Sandman will throw sand in your eyes. So close your eyes tight and go to sleep. 
Um, anyway, so this, this story is very important. It's, it's, it's significant because it inspires, 100 years after it's written, it inspires someone to write a very, very important essay. And this is uh, our friend Sigmund Freud. He writes in 1919, about 100 years after that book, he um, writes an essay about the, the Sandman. And it's very complex essay, but basically he talks about the this phenomenon, an emotional phenomenon, um, that he calls uh, unheimlich. And um, it's, about, it's about something that, uh, that, that, is, that, that frightens us, um, precisely because it's familiar. So um, let's see. I'm not a linguist, but I'll, I'll just try to explain. So the German word heimlich means familiar in English. And unheimlich, then, is the opposite, so it means unfamiliar. And unheimlich is translated into English now as uncanny, for some reason. Now, uncanny, if we invert uncanny again, we get back to canny, which actually means comes from the word ken, which is particularly weird to me. Okay, um, But it's like ken, like, ki, ki, like your kin, you know, kin, your family. Um, but... So this word is a little bit hard to, to figure out. We don't have an English word for it. Um, in fact, it, uh, let me just show you. Uh, wait, there's kids here, so I'm going to skip this. No, I'm going to skip this, but you may remember, if you ever saw The Exorcist, that terrifying scene that makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end, right? Do you remember this? That's the uncanny. And uh, the word, here to understand the word, um, we have the word deja vu. And you know that word, that's pretty comfortable. It's when you, you see something and you're like, oh, I feel like I've seen that before. Right? So something unfamiliar is familiar. Um, when the strange is familiar. Unheimlich is the opposite. It's like when something is familiar, like a girl in a bed, but then it's doing something very strange. Does that make sense? So actually, it's at the root of almost all horror movies, including very much so um, Frankenstein. And Freud talks about this, this phenomenon, what triggers it. There's all these interesting aspects to it. Um, he connects it to repression, of course, because he connects everything to repression. But uh, he's, he's trying to understand it. And they say this is his, um, his, his only essay about aesthetics. And he really tries to uh, unpack this particular piece of literature. And they say that if you read the essay, it's his most uncanny essay. In other words, reading it is an uncanny experience. And I, I just leave it to you to do this. It's, only, it's very short. It's very, it's very weird. Um, now, the uncanny, it turns out, is very, very important. And it, it really underlies um, all of gothic horror. It, is about, it really is behind why we have this fascination with vampires. Right? We have an endless vampire, endless vampire um, fixation. Uh, because vampires are exactly this. They're the familiar. They look just like us, and then they suddenly become unfamiliar when they start, you know, eating, sucking our blood. And the same is true for uh, zombies, another variant category of uncanny. But the zombies, again, you don't know who's real, who's not, who's, who's zombie, who's not, right? That's the fundamental aspect of it, and that's why we, we somehow, somehow cannot get enough. There's just an endless stream of zombie movies and zombie shows. And then also other, other stories where, like the, the Blade Runner, which is one of my favorites, where um, it all centers around the question of, of whether someone is a, uh, is a, is a, is a human or um, a replicant or some form of robot. And if you remember the scene where they basically do this empathy test, but they're trying to figure out if the person, or if, the, if the being in front of them is a, is, is, is a human or not. And it's very subtle because they, the, the, they can look, it's set in the future, and so they have abilities to be very human-like, but they're not quite human. And also, I should say that um, the, the word robot is interesting because the word robot is actually relatively new. It's less than 100 years old. It was coined by a Czech playwright in 1920. And it means, the robot means work, worker in, uh, in Czech. It's a little like Arbeit, the word in uh, German, um, which is work. And it's... Um, What's interesting to me is that this, this story, was, the, the play was written in 1920, so one year after Freud's uncanny essay. And I don't know, I have no evidence of this, but it seemed, what if, I mean, I, might, I have a hunch that maybe Carol Chapek had actually read Freud and inspired him in some way to write this and, and coin the term robot. Okay, now I'm going to 
hold that from that thought for a minute, and now let's talk about something a little different, which is um, another concept where, and I think you saw this earlier today, it's the idea that um, if, you, if you start designing robots and you, uh, you make them more and more human, they'll become more and more likable. So that's what you're seeing here. So it, you know, it's, it, this, is, this is more likable than that. This is a little more likable than that. Um, but if you go too far, um, you plunge into what's called the uncanny valley. So the likability continues to a point, and then it sort of suddenly goes down, and that's because you've gotten too human. It's too close for comfort. Does that make sense? So it's the idea that don't, don't overdo it. You want something to be human-like, but if it's really indistinguishable and you create an ambiguity, you create this, all this fear around it, and then um, you enter this, this, uncanny, this area here, this plot, and if you keep going, okay, if you're really human and you really are human, then you're likable again. Okay? So just plot, just think of this. It's not meant as a numerically accurate plot, but it's just a conceptual plot to indicate that you want us to somehow avoid this area here. And um, this term, by the way, this was coined by, a, this, the whole concept was written about by a um, researcher, a designer in, uh, in, uh, in, in Japan, Masahiro Mori, in the uh, 70s. And it was only about um, a few years later that uh, a, a, a writer, an um, art historian, made the connection between this valley that uh, was, was in the plot, and, he, and she connected it with, with Freud, and, and called it the uncanny valley. And it's actually exactly right. It's exactly what, 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 um, what it's an appropriate connection, because it's what happens in this, in this point when things become too close for comfort, something that's similar but yet not human. So that is called, that is the idea behind the uncanny valley. Now, Allison just talked about babies and uh, children. This is a very lovable little cute baby, but no, it's not. It's not a real baby. This is an um, uh, example of uh, a category of, um, of babies that have been uh, created uh, for the, something called the rebirther movement. And it's a, it's a group of mostly women uh, who collect ultra lifelike babies, baby dolls. Um, and they carry them around at supermarkets and stuff like that. Definitely uncanny, OK? <laughs> I don't know about you, but this definitely makes me a little uncomfortable. Um, and it also, the uncanny is linked to design and in things like, um, things like prosthetics. So we don't want a prosthetic leg to look too human-like. So if you just saw that foot there, you know, sticking out of, a, of a, a pair of pants, you might think that's, you're not sure if it's, it's real or not, and it makes you kind of vaguely un uncomfortable. So the uh, thinking around Uncanny Valley is, no, push it one side or the other. Make it a little less lifelike, like this, and then it feels okay, because you're like, oh, it's clearly not human, so it's like, it's just, it is what it is. It's a guy, and he's got a cool um, uh, appendage uh, prosthetic leg. And this also has informed a lot of computer graphics. So it turns out that if you want to make um, a, uh, an animation film and you make the animation too um, lifelike, um, then you will actually uh, make people uncomfortable. So um, I know we have some experts in the room who know more than I do about this, but one of the ideas that's the reason that uh, Disney and Pixar, are, are, their films are, are, are always um, very, um, Likeable is that they don't, they don't mess around, it's particularly around the eyeballs. That they, they design the eyeballs in such a way that they're clearly um, artificial. And so we, don't, we know that that's not real, and so we don't have a problem with it. So we find these kind of uh, creatures very likeable. Um, but if you made them a little bit more realistic, and, and Polar Express, if you saw that, that's a movie that actually makes an error. It falls into the uncanny valley. It's so lifelike that people get uncomfortable. They actually, it, it sort of failed in the box office because of this reason. Now, if you do make things super lifelike, you kind of run into this. So uh, and this is an example of these uh, geminoids, they're called. They're like human uh, who are very similar to their creators. So uh, in the context of, uh, of uh, Frankenstein, I mean, you be the judge, but um, these are definitely seems a little uncomfortable, a little uncanny. Um, this also may, may occurs in the realm of something like an animal. So many of you are familiar with the big dog um, uh, design of a robot that could uh, walk and uh, very beautiful and, and moves around. 
Um, you do have sound here, okay. Um, but uh, it, it, a lot of people with a sound can make them uncomfortable. It's a little too lifelike. I love this with the response by um, a, 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 a number of spooks came out. These are uh, just two guys. <laughs> I love it. I think that's such a hilarious and appropriate response to this. <laughs> um, but it's actually also at the root of a lot of art. So artists use the uncanny in a, in a very intentional way. What they do is they want to they want to raise um, uh, re reactions. They want to create responses from us. And so they'll they'll like Stellark here uses the um, the uncanny very intentionally. So he creates this. Um, he, he, he actually made an ear-shaped uh, um, uh, uh, artificial structure, had it actually surgically implanted into his forearm and such that the skin grew around it. And he claims he can hear from this thing. Um, and then another artist uh, did a, uh, a bunny where he, um, he, 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 he used um, uh, uh, some genetic material from uh, a glowing um, organism that created the bunny so that the bunny would glow in the dark. It's called the glow-in-the-dark bunny. Anyway, um, but the big question was whether there was such a bunny or whether it was real or not. It was just reported. Got a lot of people upset and angry. And then there's artists like Ron Muick, who is terrific. He makes these very gigantic scale um, uh, beings that are, again, uh, very un sort of light, extremely lifelike, but in some sense also just kind of raise that, 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 that uncanny response in us. Uh, now I'll tell you about a project that, that I did with my students. And this was um, something we built in, in 1995. And if you remember the early days of the internet, so um, the web was just coming out. And, uh, and we wanted to get involved. We wanted to contribute. So we thought, um, because I had a robotics lab, my students and I thought, well, we'll, what, we'll connect a robot to the internet. And uh, so what would we do with it? We, we had a lot of late night conversations. And we finally struck on, let's make a garden. So we called it the telegarden. We got an industrial robot arm, put it in the middle of, the, um, of this uh, basically um, three meter by three meter planter. And then um, uh, we put a camera in the tip of it. And then we, we built a web interface. So uh, this is what it looked like. This is, this is very early stage. Uh, kids won't remember this, but this is Mosaic browser um, from, the, from the early days of the web. And so you, the camera was here. And this, was the, this is the robot from the top view of the garden space here. So by clicking, you could um, move the arm, and then it would generate an image of what was underneath it. So in that way, you could, you could explore the, the, the garden from anywhere in the world. And then um, you could also go further. You could, um, you could register, and then you could help uh, tend the garden by watering. So there's a water button. So you could go to a location, click water. And um, if you watered for a little bit of time, then you were granted your first seed. And you could plant a seed in the garden. Again, anywhere you wanted. So you would, you would say plant, and you would, it would go over, pull up a seed, drop it in the location you were specified, and then dig a little hole, and, um, and then drop it in and water it. And then, of course, nothing would happen. And this was sort of the artistic part of it. Um, we were, wanted to contrast the, the instant gratification of the, of the web, which is still the case today, with, the, with nature, where things don't happen instantaneously. So you know, on the web, if, if, something, if I'm clicking and this thing isn't giving me what I want, I mean, I'm like, what the heck? This, right? We get really frustrated. But um, you know, when you plant a seed, you gotta come back the next day and water it and water it and water it. And then, you know, if you're lucky, in a couple weeks, it'll, you'll get a tiny little, you know, sprout. And I, I think that is very interesting because that, that nature has not changed in, you know, 100,000 years. And it's not, and we, it's no, it doesn't seem like we're anywhere closer to being able to accelerate that kind of growth. We just have to let it take its course. And that was really the, the message or the, um, one of the ideas behind this um, project. Um, I also, the, of course, there's unintended consequences. Any of you who are gardeners know that if you, you set up a, a, a three meter by three meter space and you invite people from all over the world, well, we got first 1,000, then 10,000, and then 100,000 people in there gardening. And so it quickly grew completely out of control and became much more of a study in the uh, tragedy of the commons. Um, 
Now, there's more I could say about this, but one of the things that really came up was, uh, was a question from a student who asked, and just emailed me out of the blue and said, um, how do I know there's really a garden? And I'll never forget getting that email, and it, was, it completely caught me off guard because, you know, we were in there working on the uh, plumbing and aphid infestations and trying to keep this thing online. Um, but I realized that I didn't have a good answer for him. I mean, how do, I, how do we know if there is... How would he or she know that there's really a garden? Because we could fake it. We could just take a bunch of photos. We could sort of create a hoax. And many people create hoaxes on the, on the web, if you haven't heard. <laughs> um, so uh, I, that was right around the time I went to Berkeley. And I, um, I uh, went and visited Professor Dreyfus. And I was thinking about this and wrestling with it. And he said, um, this is really about epistemology. I mean, how, what is knowledge? And, and how do we know that something is, 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 is factual or not? And you know, epistemology was motivated largely, uh, you know, it started in the Greeks, but then it was uh, accelerated by the discovery, the telescope and the microscope. There, there was a lot of questions raised about what we're seeing and what's really there. Um, so we together coined the term telepistemology uh, to characterize knowledge at a distance. We were very proud of ourselves. We wrote a book, uh, never caught on the term. So if you get a chance to drop it in conversation, please do. Um, anyway, this book is available from MIT Press, and it's still out there. But it, it's a collection of essays from artists, um, uh, philosophers, and engineers. Well, one thing, we, we, we were surprised by the popularity of this thing, this telegarden. And um, we started to ask, well, people will come in and spend time tending this garden. Um, would they want to do something more interesting, like uh, go into a social situation? So here's the scenario. So uh, back in the day when Obama was president, um, and he was holding these, these uh, events at his house, at the White House, um, you know, he, he might say, well, what if you could bring not just like five or six people in for dinner, but what if you could bring like everybody could come in? And so we thought, well, what we want to have is a robot that would go in, and, and people could, could watch through the eyes of the robot, right, like the telegarden. But now you're sitting around Obama's dinner table. Um, so we built something that we called the teleactor. And it looks it looked like this is this is again is uh, 90s technology, but um, she's wearing um, a gear that has uh, microphones and cameras, and it's connected to a, a wireless backpack that's connected out over the internet. And so the idea is that people would come in from um, remote locations, and then it's not just one person driving or connecting. And by the way, she's the tele actor. The, think of it like these are tele directors. And the actor still has volition and agency, so the actor isn't following orders, but the actor is listening to the you know, suggestions that come in uh, this way and then making decisions about who to talk to and who to interact with. Does that make sense? So, um, so we built versions of this. We had a grant, and we um, worked on versions. Um, one of the high points was we, we got to bring a teleactor into the Webby Awards um, at the San Francisco Opera House. And in this case, we, we, we put the camera into the... Um, opera glasses. Uh, so again, there's a wireless uh, connection, Wi-Fi connection there. And then um, she's all wired up. And we had, um, we had uh, a chance to, she was going to come on stage and interact with, um, with uh, Sam Donaldson. Now, um, I had 30 seconds to explain the idea to Sam Donaldson. And they, so I walked up and I said, uh, Mr. Donaldson, we're going to be doing an experiment. And so the, the teleactor is going to be coming on stage. And uh, she's, um, she's connected uh, over, the, over the network. And uh, they're, they're, they're watching what she's doing. And they're, uh, they're telling her uh, what to do. She's, there's a thing in her ear that's telling her what to do. And he said, wait a second. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> it was a classic moment. Anyway, they had a great interaction. It was actually the first telehug in history. When people on the internet were watching through her eyes as she went up and he gave her a big hug um, on, the, uh, on the Webby Awards. But one thing that happened also when we tried this in other contexts and we brought it into lots of um, social situations, this is a botanical garden, it didn't always work out because people got uncomfortable, right? Because they see this thing come up and they were like, um, excuse me, who are you? What are you doing? And what are the cameras? Who's connected? Who's watching me? Who's, you know, who's behind the scenes? And it was really interesting to us that it created this kind of uncanny response, that um, people weren't sure what it was and where, what, it was, uh, what was the interaction. So around this time, we also got interested in uh, the work of um, uh, Stanley Milgram, 
which were the tests about um, uh, uh, obedience to authority tests that, were hap that happened back in the, um, in the 60s, where they did tests on um, uh, people who were asked to give shocks to someone if he got the answers wrong. Everybody familiar with this famous psycho psychological test related to Phil Zimbardo's work? They were contemporaries. Um, Phil Zimbardo did the prison experiment. This was an experiment with just applying voltage, and you had some man, man, I think it was usually a man, in a white coat saying, you must continue the experiment. And people kept applying voltage to this poor gentleman here. And he was screaming with pain. Now, the, the key is he wasn't really feeling any pain. He was an actor. But they didn't know that. So um, it was, it raised, and this thing, this whole experience raised this huge psychological um, anxiety for the participants. They, many of them were traumatized so much that today we have very strict rules. You can never do this kind of experiment again. But we were interested in it. We were interested in the, the nuances of, of, of essentially about, about what you believe and what you don't believe and how you essentially put yourself at risk in certain interesting ways. So this was, again, the early days of the internet. We wanted to see if we could recreate a, a similar analogous kind of phenomenon on the internet. So um, we, we set up what we called the Tele Laboratory. And we put in two $100 bills. And you come to the website, and um, um, it was called Legal Tender. And you got one of two, um, you got, you, sorry, you get these two bills, and then you're, you're randomly assigned a sector on one of the bills. Um, and then you're asked if you want to determine which is real and which is counterfeit. Um, and so you get to perform a test. You get to choose what test to perform. And uh, so these are the choices, and almost everybody chose the uh, thermal test. And um, that surprised us a bit. Um, but that means to burn a small hole in the bill and then see the response and see if, that, see if it was real or not. And so once we did that, you, you would get to this page that was just a reminder that, um, well, federal law is that if you mutilate um, <laughs> US currency, that, that could be, you could be fined or imprisoned. And since we had your email address, uh, we just said, you know, are, do you understand and wish to proceed? Um, and uh, we wanted to just get to that moment where you would, you know, would you press the button? Because now you weren't just like clicking around, having fun on the internet. You were suddenly, essentially committing a federal crime. And um, interestingly, almost everybody said yes. <laughs> Uh, I could talk about why later, but um, you know, again, it's this question of what's real, what's not, whether, whether something was actual or virtual, the whole experience. And that's what I want to get to is that um, the uncanny, there's an element of the uncanny that we often think about, what I started with, which is the experiential uncanny, seeing something um, that looks lifelike um, and, and, and being, raising the question of whether it is or not, and what I might call the experiential uncanny, where some experience is, it's unclear what aspects of that experience are lifelike or not. I want to I want to give you one more example. Um, Mori is a series of projects that involved um, data from the Earth. Now it was seismic data, and I I, I just want to say when I first came to California, I moved here from um, from Pennsylvania, and <clears throat> when I got here, I was asking everybody, "What do you have in your earthquake kit?" And they'd be like, uh, "Ooh, I actually don't have one," and I'd be like, "What?" And, and, and I kept asking, and we got the same response everywhere. And I was like, you don't have an earthquake kit? And now, it's been, I've lived here now for 25 years, and uh, I don't have an earthquake kit either. Um, nobody does, right? So it's fascinating, because we have this grand amnesia or denial around uh, this huge threat that's like looming underneath us. But we just don't think about it. Um, so I wanted to make an artwork that would raise that about you know, awareness of this thing. And, um, so I came up with this thing called, um, um, it was, we called it an earthwork. And basically it was, uh, we connected to a seismometer at UC Berkeley, and we got the data feed from that. And we made a display that basically just showed you what it looks like, um, what, the, um, what the earth was doing at any given moment. And um, pretty simple idea. And we just put it out there, just very, just very minimalist in a way. We called it Memento Mori. And, um, and I put it out, and then uh, a friend who was a, a, a composer came by and he said, well, that's cool, but what if we made it, send it to sound? And so we ended up making a soundscape from the sound of the Earth. So it was always changing and sonifying the sound of the Earth. If you just listen to the signal, by the way, you don't hear anything. It's too low frequency. So you have to sonify it. But um, um, we got an opportunity to present this at the San Francisco Opera House. 
in uh, 2006, which was the um, 100th anniversary of the San Francisco earthquake. So it was in April. It was almost 100 years to the day. We got to do this um, with a ballet dancer, Mur Muriel Maffre, principal dancer of the San Francisco Ballet. And we, had, we brought in sound. We brought in uh, internet connection into the opera house, blasted it, and she danced. Which, by the way, if you know ballet, like that, you'd never do that, right? In ballet, everything is very practiced, very rehearsed. Everything is exact. You don't improv. But she was brave enough to do it. Um, we also did a, a, a visual version of this. And it was right around the time that Kenneth Nolan, the, uh, the abstract painter, died. And we, um, um, we made a color field version of, of Mori um, that basically, again, is triggered by changes in the signal that then generates what we call blooms that were color, basically colorized based on um, the data. And it uh, looks kind of like this. And this is still online. If you can search for it, it's called, um, I forget the name of it. Um, something Mori. Anyway, it's, uh, it's out there. <laughs> God. Um, it's, uh, but it's online. And you can, if you go to my website, actually, you find it. But it basically um, is, is, is sort of showing a visual representation of, this, of the motion of the Earth, which is constantly in motion. Again, not, not when there's an earthquake, necessarily, but just any time the Earth is constantly moving. And then we did a version, another sonified version of this, um, with the anniversary of the, in this case, the, uh, the, the Campanile at UC Berkeley. I'll just show you a clip from that. <laughs> All right, so what's going on there is that the sound, the, the signal is being used to basically drive the, uh, the bells in the bell tower and the lights. So you're seeing what's happening in the earth in a visual way. All right, so again, one of the things that came up there as well, which is, well, how do I know if that really is what it's purported to be, right? Is it really data coming in from the earth? And particularly, is it recorded or is it live? Because it would make a big difference, right? If it's just a bunch of recorded data and you're just doing that, it's not that interesting. But if it's live, then it, gets, it takes on a whole new characteristic. OK, so again, the representational uncanny and the experiential uncanny, all robots are mirrors. Let me leave you with that thought. Thank you. OK, we have some time for questions. questions? Yes. Can you, speak, can, can you speak up? Can you speak in the mic, please? Testing. Ah, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming today, Ken, um, Mr. Goldberg. Uh, so in unpacking the Uncanny Valley, I know that the Uncanny Valley relates very much to robot design and the outward appearance of a robot. But couldn't also the functionality or the uh, directive of a robot also be related to Uncanny Valley. For instance, uh, you know, back in 2000, uh, end of 2017, there was that robot that Nightscope released with the uh, that was designed to autonomously navigate in, uh, the SPCA in San Francisco, and it was pulled after one month uh, because people couldn't, you know, they found it a little bit too chilling to, you know, have this robot that was moving around. Um, Exactly, scaring off the homeless. Uh, couldn't that also relate to the uncanny valley? Definitely, definitely, yeah. So they, um, there, you, you, this is absolutely true. And we make this mistake all the time with uh, designs with, uh, with, with robot systems. Um, one, I would say, that's, uh, that's very recent a case that's, that also is related to, um, to, to robots is uh, what happened just happened last week in uh, Arizona. Right? You did see this that the, a, a robot car basically drove over this poor, poor person. Um, I think you know many of us. If you watch the video, you have that same uncanny kind of feeling. You know, something is really wrong. And um, I have a personal feeling about that. I, I do think that we are we're 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 overselling uh, autonomous driving. Uh, we can talk about this afterward. But I'm I'm a skeptic. I think we're going to have. Uh, vehicles that can drive on freeways. We already have that. It's going to get better and better. But as soon as we get off the freeway, I think I want a human behind the wheel. Because I don't trust, and especially if this thing is no human and this thing drives up and it's in my neighborhood, I'm not going to be comfortable walking on the streets. I think this is going to be, and it relates to this uncanny. So how you design these things, you know, the idea that there's no steering wheel, not a good idea in my view. So it's all about perception and psychological responses. Another one, 
Uh, not to pick on a, a large company in the area, but uh, another one is the uh, is is uh, the the Google Glass, right? Google Glass was was another thing that was very similar to the Tully actor actually made people uncomfortable, and it was because it was um, you know it was not clear what's going on. And people were comfortable with that, and you know when they're in a bar or something like you just come in with a camera. I don't know. I didn't give my permission to that, right? So people didn't like it, and it really you know had a huge negative reaction. So um, I think that there's really something, uh, something important in all kinds of design for, for not only robots, but all kinds of technologies and, and other things too. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, um, I recently saw an experiment where some students made an animatronic ottoman. Can you, and, can oh, you yes. talk to the microphone, please? Oh, yeah. They made an animatronic uh, ottoman. Yeah. And some of the people were treating the ottoman like a pet. They actually petted the ottoman. Right. And I'm wondering, like, so why do you think we would interact with an uh, you know, inanimate object like that and be creeped out by, you know, like a robot that looks like a human? Okay, so the, the interesting that um, I think that's Wendy Ju did these experiments. Yeah. She's really interesting. So um, and then she did some of these here at Stanford. I think part of it was that she um, she was she's she's very much conscious of this issue and she was Trying to see to what degree people would feel comfortable. I think it's a perfect example where people like it because it's obviously not a human, right? It's a it's a it's an ottoman, right? It's moving around, um, and they find they found it uh, charming. And actually, I've seen some of the videos, and it is very charming. So I think um, you know we do this all the time. Look at teddy bears, we, we we cars, we we project onto these things, and we create you know um, emotions around them, and those are great. It's just when something gets really human-like that we get uncomfortable. So that's my point, is that if it's, if it's ambiguous, that's where we're into the uncanny valley. Yes? Do you think there's a general trend towards um, exploiting or playing with this concept of the uncanny more in our culture? And if so, does that risk kind of a desensitization to, um, to the uncanny and kind of also to the concept of reality as you as you talked about. Oh, great question. Good, good. All right. So yes, does um, you know if we if we keep doing this, is it something that we're doing more, and so we're desensitizing ourselves? And I think that's actually a great point because what's uncanny today, after I see, spend time with it a little bit, it doesn't seem so uncanny. It kind of wears off, right? And uncanny has a has a temporal aspect to it. Um, so absolutely, I think that's that's a great point. You can you can kind of it's uncanny is a little bit of like like the deja vu. It's kind of a fleeting thing. It kind of you you can create that sensation, but if you overplay it, uh, it can kind of it kind of you be, it becomes over uh, desensitized. So um, yeah, I think that's what, exactly what's happening with a lot of our technology. Yeah, we're 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 starting that. I think you know it's an interesting question because some have said that Google Glass and other things will come back, right? Because we'll now once we have had time to absorb it, and now we'll. That may very well happen, but it's, a, it's the, uh, in, in the initial response that you have to think about. And, um, and I, I think that, you know, is it happening more in our culture? It's a good question. I, I leave it to you to think about where you see it, where you don't. It's really interesting as a concept because, again, we don't have a word for it, uncanny. Um, and, um, I mean, it's not a word natural in our English language, and, and Freud, Freud's Essay and his theory about it is is also so int intricate and subtle. So I, I just what I hope I could do is let, keep this as something that you're you kind of like think about, and then um, informs you know art artworks and ideas and literature and 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 actually quite a bit what's ha now happening. Well, one word I didn't say today, which is AI, which is absolutely at the forefront today, and you know it's about machines that do really human things like play. Chess and that they are intelligent or even super intelligent. And blurring that line is causing a lot of anxiety. So I think it's up to the researchers to be careful how we pose those things and how we present them so that we don't imply that this is actually becoming human. I think we're out of time. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.